In this video, we examine consecutive reactions. Consecutive reactions are, are those that take place uh, in a series of steps like this. Right, so reaction, our overall reaction would be uh, reagents to go to products, but there's at least one intermediate into uh, the reaction mechanism. Okay, so the uh, mechanism that we're going to examine is just that that only contains one intermediate, and these, these reactions are fairly common. Right, so we're going to do a kinetic analysis of uh, these reactions, assuming that the rate constant for the first step is K1, and the rate constant of the second step is K2. Right, the goal here would be to obtain the integral uh, loss for each one of the species, especially reagents and products. And also, uh, this scheme of consecutive reactions is going to be very useful to introduce in later videos uh, approximations that are going to be uh, uh, very, uh, very, very useful for us, like the uh, rate limiting step, uh, the steady state approximation, and so forth. Okay, so this is going to be kind of a generic uh, mechanism that we're going to solve here uh, fully analytically without any approximations. And then in later videos, we will see how this changes when you introduce approximations. Right, so again, the, uh, what we can do is try to figure out what the integrated rate laws are for each one of the species. The first one would be uh, A, okay, reagents. And we can write here the rate law for the reagent simply as this. Okay, this is equal to K1 over A. All right, uh, again, this is a reaction mechanism, so these are elementary steps. We can write the rate laws by just looking at the reaction stoichiometry. There's only one reaction in which A is involved, and that is A transforming into the intermediate. Uh, this is just first order kinetics. Uh, we've uh, already uh, examined this in uh, prior material, and we can write the rate law simply as concentration of A is equal to the concentration of A at time zero, e to the minus K1t. All right, so, so far nothing new. Now, the next thing that we could do is try to figure out what the concentration uh, uh, of products, how the concentration of products changes in time. And the rate for products, then, uh, would be as follows. The change in the concentration of products in time would be equal to K2 concentration of I. All right, uh, the only reaction that is producing products here is I reacting through rate constant K2 and generating products. Okay. However, this is not a good uh, rate law because uh, in the rate law you have here a dependence of, on the concentration of the intermediate, and that can never happen in rate law. Uh, the rate law can only depend on reagents and occasionally on products, but never on intermediates. So of course we need to find what the integrated rate law is for the concentration of the intermediate so that we can plug it here and then solve. All right, so how do we solve? for the concentration of the intermediate. Well, uh, we can try to write what the rate law for the intermediate would be. Now, the intermediate is interesting because there's two reactions that are contributing to the changes in the concentration of the intermediate. First, we have that there's a positive contribution from uh, A reacting through rate constant K1 to give rise to the intermediate, right? So that would be one of the two contributions. Uh, K1 then is the concentration of A. And then we have a negative contribution to the uh, concentration of I because I is disappearing from the reaction as it reacts to products. Right, so that's going to have a negative sign. Okay, and the rate of I is going to be K2 concentration of I. Right, so that is the total rate law for uh, the concentration of I. Uh, now, to obtain the uh, explicit dependence of the concentration of I on time, the integrated rate law for I, we would need to integrate this differential expression. Now, that integration is a little bit more difficult than uh, what we're used to, and we're actually not going to solve it. Instead, we're just going to write the solution, and then uh, we will examine it to see how it, uh, you know, how it looks like. All right, so uh, after integration of this, which we're not doing explicitly, the concentration of I is equal to uh, K1 over K2 minus K1, E to the minus K1T minus E to the minus K2T, multiplied times the concentration of A at time zero. Okay? So one of the things that we can actually do is see how uh, that changes on time. All right, so here we can plot concentrations as a function of time. Okay, and we would say that, well, if we plot the concentration of reagents as a function of time, that is just a first order decay. That should be something like this. Okay, that would be what happens to the concentration of A. Now the concentration of the intermediate, again, we would just plot this as a function of time, and then what you would see is that depending on what K1 and K2 are, uh, this may be something like that. Okay, that was what will happen for uh, the concentration of I. 
and then we still have to see what happens to the concentration of product that that's coming uh, coming up. All right, so for the concentration of products, again, uh, what we actually have is that uh, uh, this is the great law for the concentration of products. Again, there's only one reaction that generates products, and that's I uh, falling through uh, rate constant K2. Uh, and then uh, that is the rate law. And we actually have right here what the concentration of I is. So what we have to do is take that expression, plug it into here, and then carry out the integration. That integration is actually not that as complicated as this one is, and that's something that we could in principle do. Okay. Uh, but there's another trick that we're going to uh, introduce that avoids integration to find out what the concentration of product is. And that is to use the mass balance of the enzyme. That's going to be the trick. Right? Again, notice that we have the concentration of A, we have the concentration of I, and the mass balance of, I said the enzyme, but it's not the enzyme, it's just the mass balance of the reaction, would be as follows. Uh, you have that initially, you only have uh, concentration of reagents. And then after the reaction has started at any time, uh, this concentration, if the stoichiometric coefficients are 1, 1, and 1, then that will be equal to uh, whatever concentration of A you have, plus uh, however much intermediate is present, and then uh, however much product is present. Okay, so again, if this was one more initially, the sum of uh, whatever is left of reagents, the intermediate product, should be one more as well. Okay, so that, that's what we call the mass balance in this case of the reaction. And again, this is something that we will use quite a bit when we look at uh, uh, enzyme catalyzed reactions. Okay? Now, so the, the key here is to try to solve for the uh, concentration of products. The concentration of products is then going to be equal to the initial concentration of uh, the reagent minus the concentration of the reagent at, after the reaction has started minus the concentration of the intermediate. Okay, and again, this is uh, far simple than trying to integrate the expression that you would get off here, okay, because there's no integration. Notice that this is just A naught. The concentration of A is what we have right here, and the concentration of I is, is this thing. Okay, so this is just our algebra that you can solve, okay, to find that the concentration of product is going to be equal to one, plus K1E to the minus K2T minus K2E to the minus K1T multiplied by the concentration of A at time zero. Okay? And of course, if you plot this, uh, what will happen is something like this. Okay, that's how the concentration of products changes. Okay, exactly uh, how uh, these concentrations are, that will be dictated by, dictated by the values of K2 and K1. And one of the homework problems will ask, uh, ask you to see how these uh, concentration profiles change when you uh, use various values for K1 and K2. Right, so in summary, uh, what we've done here is introduce uh, the concept of consecutive reactions. Consecutive reactions are, uh, will be important when we examine complicated reaction mechanisms, including those that involve enzymes. Okay, and can be generically represented by this scheme. Okay, now uh, what we see is that well, the reagents uh, simply simple. Well, the integrated rate law is just the first order decay, and this is nothing new. Now uh, the intermediate that is something new. Okay, and you can see that clearly initially the concentration should increase and then eventually fall, and then you have the concentration of products changes in this fashion. Uh, so we have been able to obtain the three integrated rate laws. Uh, and again, something that should be, uh, you should retain from this is that the moment where we start to build here uh, complexity in the reaction mechanism, right? so for example, the addition of one intermediate, that seems to complicate quite a bit um, uh, the integrated rate loss, as you can see. Okay, but uh, again, we're not going to focus uh, uh, on this uh, in the future. Instead, what we're going to do is see how uh, these expressions uh, can be modified very in a, in a very easy way when you uh, introduce approximations like uh, uh, the rate limiting step or the steady state approximation. Mm -hmm.